S5 student to student STEM lecture series event. Uh, my name is Gabriel Mitzer. Arjun Ganga, Evan Easton, Nathan Ryder, and I comprise the board of the Des Moines S5. Uh, we're all students at the West Des Moines and Des Moines high schools. Our first speaker is Professor Timothy Ernest. Professor Timothy Ernest is an associate professor of computer science at Drake University. He has been recognized as Outstanding Teacher of the Year in the College of Arts and Sciences. His research in computer graphics and scientific vis visualization has resulted in various publications. Professor Ernest earned his PhD in computer science from the University of Minnesota in 2006. I met Professor Ernest when I attended his app camp several years ago. I found him to be an interesting speaker, engaging and knowledgeable. Professor Ernest will take questions after the presentation. And now I'm excited to introduce to you Professor Ernest. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'm excited to be here. Um, today we're talking about uh, visualizing scientific data with uh, computer graphics. So um, the basic idea here is to kind of illustrate some visualization principles and why you should visualize data in a certain way and not in other ways. I'll talk about things I've worked on or are currently working on. And then also I'll talk a little bit about STEM education, what it is to get a PhD or a master's degree and, and that sort of stuff as well. Um, then finally, some concluding remarks. I'm going to aim for about 35 minutes or so. If you do have questions, um, feel free to, to shoot them out while, while they, they, they come to mind. So um, we will take it from there. All right, so um, the question here I want to start talking about is how do we represent data effectively? How do we visualize data? Um, because it, it can, it's possible that you could represent data in a misleading way. And we don't want to do that. We want to be kind of true to this, our scientific approach here. We want to do what's called a graphical excellence. It gives the viewer uh, the greatest number of ideas from our data in a short time, with the least amount of ink or pixels um, in a small amount of space. It's always, almost always multivariate in nature. Um, it requires telling the truth, because it's possible that you can be misleading with graphics or data if you want to be. Right? So here's something actually from um, the New York Times back in the 70s. They talk about these fuel economies, right? But they lie. This graph is like cheating. Because like the length of this line, since so it represents the number 27 and a half, is not proportional to the length of this line that represents 18. Right? So this graph is, is it's, it's faking the data, right? It's, it's, it's kind of twisting the data for, for a purpose to, to make a, a point, but it's not being a real scientific, if you will, right? Here's another way of that sometimes people will try to cheat or, or use the visualization in a misleading way. I'm using area or volume to represent a linear scale, right? Look how big this dollar is over here when it was you know, back in the 50s, and now how tiny this dollar is here. Well, it's a linear scale. It's a, a, a dollar versus 44 cents. But they're using both the width and the height, and they're scaling both of those. And so this dollar is actually a quarter of the size of this one, not just 40% of the size. Um, another kind of way of using the width and the height uh, in a misleading way. Don't do this. This is, this is you know, not <laughs> scientific, right? This is uh, propaganda type of stuff. Um, and so keep your eye out for things like this. You know, newspapers or magazines can sometimes try to mislead you in ways <laughs> that, that aren't so ethical. Um, so it's important to represent data accurately as possible. Sometimes this happens even accidentally. Something really tragic happened back on January 28th, 1986. Do you know what that was? Yeah. Right, right. Uh, so also, um, about nine years ago, I guess, right, the, or 20, 20, 19 years ago, like, let's like, do the math right. Right, back in 1986, the Challenger exploded because of, uh, it was launched and it was too cold, and these uh, O-rings leaked. And, and, and it, it caused a problem, right? And so then, then we lost a, a Challenger, the explosion, and the Aspen Nuts aboard as well. Sadly enough, when I did this for my students just a few months ago, they didn't understand, they didn't remember what uh, happened back in the 80s. So anyways, um, so the engineers that designed those rockets initially opposed launching on that date. It was cold, they were worried about it. They initially said, wait a second, I'm not sure. They faxed these charts to NASA, they scrutinized these charts, they scrutinized the data. They had the data to make the correct decision, but they made the wrong decision because it wasn't understood correctly. Right? Here's one of the charts that they had. 
that they poured over these numbers and they tried to figure out, you know, was it safe or was it not safe? Here's some test data they had of, of other uh, of launches and that sort of stuff. Um, and so the thing is, the data wasn't presented in a way that was easily understandable. And that caused them to make a bad decision. Instead, a graph that might have helped, and of course this is in, in retrospect, in hindsight, um, it's a lot easier to make these decisions, but here's a graph that might have helped. This is a guy, the name Edward Tuffy made this graph, that said, okay, here is the temperature we're launching at, here are all the other launches, and here is an indication of all the damage that occurred to these O-rings and other launches. So if we kind of you know, speculate what might happen here, um, this is foreseeable. We had the data to make the correct decision, but it wasn't quite visualized correctly at the, at the right time. So you know, visualizing data effectively is important. Um, we can apply color to scientific, visual, uh, to scientific data as well. Um, there's lots of different ways, lots of different ranges of colors to map that onto uh, different colors of data, right? So this would map to like your lowest value of your data field, and this would map to your highest level of data field. You can have any color spectrum that you want to. And in fact, you, know, you can create lots of really ugly scientific pictures if you want to, using lots of different color mapping scales. Um, it turns out some of these are more effective than others. Uh, you've seen the rainbow color map all over the place. I you should. I, should, I submit that you should never see the rainbow color map. This is a bad visualization um, for these purposes. Do you recognize this, this data here that I colored with the rainbow color map? No? How about now? <laughs> right? It's just depending on how you color the data, it makes, it, it makes a big difference how you interpret the data. Same data, just, just colored differently. Um, here are some other problems. The big issue with the rainbow color map it has this yellow patch inside of it. And yellow has a high luminance value. It's brighter than all the other colors in the rainbow color map. And so you're kind of predisposed to have this highlighted version of your data that exists, even though it's unintentional. It just happens to, to land at this point in, in the space on your data field. So you have this kind of artificial highlighting region, which is unintentional in most cases. Um, so here's some examples of, of you know, how you could use a rainbow color map and how it could be even more effective, uh, effectively used instead of using a rainbow color map. Uh, weather maps drive me crazy, right? Because they're kind of already kind of pigeonholed into using this rainbow color map. They've been using it for, for decades. Um, and there's really no good reason why there's a change between the yellow and the green. It's just kind of how that data happens to map to that the, the rainbow color, color map. Um, so, you know, you know you're a computer scientist when you're in the basement. I'm in the basement, actually, of my house at this time when this huge, you know, storm front's coming. Because here's Des Moines, right? Here's Ankeny. Uh, my house is right over there. Um, but I'm taking screenshots because I'm furious at this, this, this color map that's being used. It's not effectively representing the data very well. Um, so what color map should you use? Well, there's lots to choose from that would be better than the rainbow color map. But it kind of depends on the application the audience, uh, on the audience. A heated object color map has a lot of nice properties associated with it, right? It goes from black to white in kind of this range here. One of those nice properties is that, right, the luminance value, the brightness value goes from low to high consistently through the entire color map. So in general, you should try to look for color maps that, that do that effectively. Otherwise, you might be misrepresenting your data. Does that make sense? <coughs> um, other issues with color is this thing called chromospheriopsis. What it basically means is that different colors hit the back of your retina a little bit differently at different uh, convergence points. And so red and blue are kind of on the opposite spectrum, literally the, the spectrum, and so the longer wavelengths kind of come forward and the shorter wavelengths go here to receive. Uh, so those two colors, this is my eye, looks like the red kind of popping off the screen a little bit, right? And the blue is kind of fading inside the screen a little bit too. Right? This is just how our eyes work. And so you have to be careful as well if you're using red and blue next to each other. You might have an unintended depth perception happening there, right? You don't want to do stuff like this, especially on slides. Um, uh, so we talked about luminance. Luminance is basically the measure of the amount of light underneath it. So here's a nice interval sign if you want to be really, really technical about it. It's basically how bright stuff is. Um, so there's a thing called equiluminance, right? Colors could have the same apparent brightness even though be different colors. And um, you get a lot of depth, a lot of cues, like from 
stereo or inclusion of emotion from at luminous or from luminous values. And so I don't know if you can read that, but this would be a really bad thing to do is to have the background and your foreground have the same luminance values. Right? There's, they're different colors, but they have the same apparent luminance values, so it's really hard to read. Can you read that, actually? Yeah, where it says, this could be a very annoying choice for a text color, uh, because the background and the foreground have, the same, have similar luminance values. Um, right, so same with rainbow color map, don't use uh, so colors like deep red and, and, and dark blue, a bright red and dark, deep blue for chromostereopsis purposes. Um, and we do visualize data, and we're, we visualize data in lots of different walks of life. Right? Your magazines, your, your newspapers do it, you can do it in the scientific field as well. Um, when you do collect some data, this is a quote uh, from a, a famous uh, book a little bit ago. Um, after a person has collected the data and studied the proposition with great care so that his own mind is made up, the best solution for a problem, he's had to feel that his work is done. It's not, right? Because when he's made up his own mind, it's only halfway done. The more difficult part is to convince the minds of others of the same conclusion. Right? This is nothing new under the sun. This is over a century old right? of, of using printing, but now we have the same kind of onus on uh, visualizing data and presenting data on now in the digital world. Um, so getting information out of itself is not all that useful, right? We've got lots and lots of data, big data happening. We're collecting data all over the place, cell phones and YouTube and all sort of stuff. But the getting information isn't all that particularly useful. What is useful is making sense out of it. Can I analyze it appropriately? So understanding and communicating or visualizing information so number one, the cells can't always speak for themselves, so we want to visualize our data to make more sense out of it. Tables and graphs are usually really good ways of communicating that data. Um, the problem is that not all the tables and graphs that we create are very effective. Right? So here's one. I would suspect that you know, we've made lots of graphs kind of like this. It's really easy to do on computers nowadays. But this isn't a really, it's not a very effective visualization. Um, it's dramatic, it's colorful, it's, it looks nice, it's three dimensions, but it's, you know, what can you glean from that diagram, right? Is that good news and bad news, or bad news? Are the sales getting better or worse? Can you, how can you relate these figures to, to the quarters and that sort of thing? What would have been better would be just to actually put the numbers in a table. I can ask a lot more interesting questions from this representation of the data than I could from that three-dimensional red, green, and blue uh, for data. Um, so this would be a better representation. It's not quite as splashy, but still more effective. Here's another uh, visualization. Um, so this is like favorable or unfavorable views of the United States and Brazil in the third percentage and Mexico in their percentage. And, and it's a really poor layout. It's hard to get any sense of any trends whatsoever with the data represented this way. Same data, different layout, much more intuitive. Right? And I can, I can kind of see um, people are, are people and see kind of the perception of the United States a lot more easily just changing how the data is represented. Pie charts. I hate pie charts. Um, they're all over the place because the people, I think, think that they represent the data effectively or they make, make them three-dimensional pie charts. Right? Microsoft Excel can do this really easily. Um, right, so here's a deliberate cartoon. Pie charts seem compelling. This is, I like this my favorite pie chart, actually. So sometimes they're good. But um, you should generally avoid pie charts, and here's the reason why. The human eye is not really good at estimating the area of pie charts. You can only compare slices that are really next to each other as far as the size is concerned. You know? Which slice is largest in this series of pie charts? That's difficult, isn't it? Right? But if I represent the data this way, it tells a much different story. A much more compelling story, in my observation. All right, so um, tables and graphs are usually the best way to communicate this quantitative information. Right? So students have been trained to do this effectively. It seems intuitive, but it's not really intuitive. It's really easy to find data represented poorly. Here's an example of really bad data visualization. 
right? It's, it looks really, really flashy, but really does a poor job of actually representing any of the data effectively at all. Um, so I blame Microsoft, <laughs> which is my general platform, is to blame Microsoft whenever the thing goes wrong. Um, that was supposed to be funny. Actually, you know, when the PC was introduced, there was a, a program called Lotus 1, 2, 3 that made charts really easy to generate. And because it was easy to generate, people thought they were visualizing it effectively. Um, but that's not necessarily the, the case. Um, so just be conscientious is kind of one of the take home messages for, for us right now is be conscientious of how you represent and visualize and absorb data. Um, I think that visualizing data and creating charts is a lot like drawing cartoons. Because I could give you all the details here. But really what I'm trying to convey is this over here. If I want to just convey this over here, it's my job as a data scientist to kind of tell you to paint the right picture so that it's really obvious what I'm trying to get you in instead of giving you all the data itself. Um, so tables, we talk about those. One thing about, nice thing about tables is that it's really easy to, to look up individual values. Uh, so this is potentially really an effective way Again, it's not very flashy, but it's effective. You use graphs when you're trying to display trends and features. So this would be, you know, when you're trying to do a timeline on the bottom here, is a good way your visual system then can kind of detect trends and features. I can say that, okay, domestic sales seem to increase, international sales are, are staying steady. This is a dip in August that might be explained by, you know, people going on vacation in August or something like that. But I can see those trends really effectively using graphs. It might be harder to do in a table. Um, I'm going to keep on moving past this really quickly. I want to talk a little bit about more visualization principles. When we look at an image, um, our eyes tend to see this familiar shape, right? and our minds quickly categorize that into a pattern. <clears throat> so what's this? It's a rose. Do you see anything funny about it? Do you see a dolphin? Aha, uh -huh, now you do, right? But when you initially got the picture, you categorized it as a rose. It wasn't until I pointed out the dolphin. The dolphin is right here. It's the fin. There's the nose. There's the dorsal fin there. Right, so there's a, you see it now? There's the dolphin, right? So when we look at the image, our eyes kind of categorize that shape. Um, they work, visualizations work best when they display information as patterns that are familiar and easy to spot. Um, similarly, memory plays a significant role when you're visualizing data. Um, working memory is pretty limited. We typically only remember the elements which, which we actually visually focus on or attend to. Pay close attention to this picture. All right? Now, what did I change? Ah, somebody caught it. Was it? Yeah, very good. How many see anything different? I got one person back there, and I take that and try to try again. Right? <coughs> Most of you weren't paying attention to the trees behind the object there. But now that you're actually attending to it, now you can notice the difference. Right? So when you're creating visualizations, it's important to right, make familiar shapes and also make sure the students are, 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 or the people are taking attention to what you want them to. Um, Right, working memory, we don't see clearly things we don't focus on directly. Right. So that's kind of visualization principle stuff. I want to fly through lots of different things that I've kind of worked on and give you a flavor of some computer science and deceptive visualization research. Um, my dissertation, the thing that I created to get my, my PhD, was on flow visualization. We were trying to focus on how can we effectively visualize variables related to turbulent flow, to better understand why we have turbulence. It's a really complicated problem. So we have lots of different variables we're trying to visualize all at the same time. We've got the flow of the, the wind over the airplane wing, for example. But in addition to that, we've got these variables called Reynolds shear stress and swirl and vorticity components and this out-of-plane vector component. All those things we want to visualize at the same time to get a better sense for how they all contribute to these vortex packets and, and what causes uh, uh, turbulence. So it's highly desirable to create images that allow for all those different distributions to be visualized at the same time and in the context of all the different distributions. So I'm going to put all those pictures together and, and get a way that I can kind of get a better picture for this turbulent flow. 
So the first thing I did is I got three different variables here. I kind of glued them all together and put the color on top of each other. And I got this. And I showed this to the aerospace engineers at the University of Minnesota, and they said, well, what the heck does that mean? Why do I have red and green mixing together to get yellow? Well, this is what happens with light. When red light is combined with a yellow light or with green light, it turns yellow. But that wasn't that satisfying, so I changed the color, how that mixed, and still not quite really all that compelling. That this muddy brown color here. And the issue is, right, if I have lots of different colors on top of each other, they really muddy the waters. I can't say that in here it's a mixture of lots of different colors, right? There's red and there's blue and there's orange and there's green that constitute this grayish patch in the middle. So what we did is ask a question, how can we have this combination of colors effectively represented? We create up this program we call color weaving. You see, like in, in fabrics, those two, two strands can maintain their color integrity when they're woven together. And so we did that same sort of approach with our flow visualization. And so now I can basically each strand of these guys so they maintain its color, and now I can see that there's a, a high rich mixture of different distributions in that center panel. See what I mean? All right, so um, we had this, this algorithm which we took lots of different colors, and it'll fly through this really fast, but it's kind of boring. Right, it's a process called line angle convolution, which basically um, used some mathematics and some uh, uh, calculus here to basically calculate the streamline, and I blurred along, I convolved along that streamline, which created these kind of Van Gogh-like looking uh, images that represent the flow field pretty well. Um, and then we, along that streamline, we calculated the value, which corresponds to one of the components, and also got the saturation, which corresponds to the scalar value, and we mix all that all together, and you get something like this. Right? And I showed this to the aerospace engineers and they flip out because now they can analyze lots of different variables at the same time. They can say, oh, I've got this big patch of blue over here. That means there's negative vorticity happening. And right above, a patch of positive vorticity in the red. And there's this red on shear stress stuff happening in the green. And there are these little packets of vorticity along those patches, which is an indication of these vortex packets that's happening along this, this flow plane. So here's a, a cartoon of these hairpin packets which is causing the turbulence on, on this, in this wind tunnel. And you see evidence of those, by basically cutting off those, le those legs, of uh, those hairpin packets here in all the, where the conditions are correct. So um, that was a big win and, and a, a nice publication we created for, for the aerospace engineers um, several years ago. Um, we'll talk about other combinations could be effectively visualized. We also looked at how we get a shape from shading. All right, so if I look at this picture here, it looks to me like I've got six of those little buttons are kind of popping off the screen, right? And the other, uh, what, eight seem to be recessing into the screen? Right, they're just shaded differently. That actually didn't change the screen at all. The screen is still two-dimensional. That's also kind of, kind of fun. Um, but if I flip the image upside down, I get the exact opposite effect. Right? Those initial buttons that were convex now become concave and vice versa. Um, and so this just happens to be because right, the stuff that's shaded on the top are kind of predisposed to that kind of reflecting the light because light kind of comes from above. And it turns out that if you turn it sideways, you really kind of lose that effect altogether, don't you? All right, so um, what we did is we used an embossing technique. We took our scalar field, we took an embossing technique, we basically kind of created that light shining from above process, and then we applied lots of vector fields on top of it. And then that embossing basically also represents another scalar field, another data piece that we could visualize at the same time. Um, so more pictures that are kind of nice, and we get stuff like this. All right, um, so I'm moving through, I'm going to go through these pictures. Talk about how another thing we did is we created a streamline, basically expanded the, the width of them, and then we could apply different textures or different pictures on top of those streamlines um, to, to visualize and use lots of different visual approaches to represent the streamlines. Um, and then, of course, we could apply this to three dimensional streamlines as well. And apply that texture, apply that picture, and then kind of twist that texture to represent how much the, 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 the vector field is, is twisting in a twisting motion in our, in our data. All right, so 
Um, some stuff we did at Drake, we did a virtual reality lab. Uh, this is a kind of a cool project that I did with the students. There is a human cadaver project where they took somebody's uh, body who, um, they dumped their body to science after they passed away and they froze them and then they started milling off and it's little, little pieces, took pictures of all of his body parts, all those slices of his body parts. They put it on a computer, which allows us to do stuff like this. I can reassemble all those slices together, and then I could create a visualization program where I could, for example, take away all the skin and look at the bone structure, or take away all the bones and look at the muscle structure, that sort of stuff. So I had a student that worked with that data set. Um, I had a student do some astronomy visualization um, and visualize things in three dimensions to create uh, models of the strong youth fields um, and protein visualizations with haptics devices which could allow us to kind of poke and touch at, at three-dimensional models as well. All right, so the good stuff, right? So that's kind of my history stuff, the research that I've done. I want to talk a little bit about where a lot of you are at, right? The so students in the room, you're a high school student, maybe you're a middle school student. What does this mean? What does STEM education mean for you? You're thinking maybe you want to uh, talk about, uh, think about going to college or studying a STEM field. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about how to pick the right college. So eventually, many of you are going to go and do some college visits, right? You're kind of going to go to one of these schools and try to see if the right, it's the right college for you. And so the thing that I would, I would suggest you do is talk to professors. You're going to put a lot of money into this decision. This is a, your education is going to be a lot of money here, there. So do a lot of research. Talk to professors. Go visit the school. Um, ask the professors what opportunities they have for undergraduates. You want to have a school where the professors are really intentional about getting to know their students and investing in their students. Um, so ask lots and lots of questions. If you're looking for the right fit, go and visit. You want to ask lots of questions. Um, I think that as far as which school you should go to, you should go to Drake. <laughs> no, so you should go to a school that, that's the right fit for you. Um, a lot of times, I think students get uh, sucked into going where um, they think is popular or they think that is, is kind of a cool place to go. What you're really looking for is a place where professors care about their students. You're going to get a really intentional uh, education. Um, and I think, I, I, I like Drake because I think we do that pretty well, but there's lots of other schools that do that well in addition to Drake. So, uh, to go and visit, ask questions. And if you, if you run out of questions to ask, ask for examples of how they apply, to how they, they, they uh, what opportunities there are for undergraduates, for research opportunities, and, and things like that. So, you're looking for ask lots of questions. Um, so, the advice I have for when you do get to college, I think that I see a lot of students that don't do this really well. The first thing to do is make sure you get enough sleep. This is actually apply applicable for you right now, right? All the students right now. Get enough sleep. Don't cram. Um, you're, you're way better off if you, if you kind of invest your time and plan your time so that you are getting full nights of sleep and not staying up and trying to study for exams. Um, sit in the front of the classroom. Um, a lot of times these colleges will have big lecture halls. Sometimes they'll have to take you know, psychology 101 with you know, 300 students in it. If you sit in the back of the class, which is kind of tempting, but if you sit in the back of the class, you're oftentimes going to be um, distracted by other students. You're not going to get the, the attention of the professor. It might be harder to ask a question. So the well, so advice I give for students going to college is always sit in the front of the classroom. Uh, don't be afraid of your professors. Get to know your professors. Our job is to help you with your education. And so if you're stuck, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact the professors. Go to their office hours and make use of their resource. Professors are very much like tour guides, right? We're trying to guide you on a path towards through your education. So if you don't ask any questions and just kind of just let the class go as it might, you're not taking a full advantage of your college experience. Um, so it's important to you know, go to the professor, make sure they know your name, and, and give, maybe make a relationship with the professors. Uh, don't skip class. Um, this is a pet peeve of mine. Don't skip class. Eve, so this kind of goes back to you know, get enough sleep, or you're paying a lot of money. And one of the great things about college is that you have more autonomy than you do in high school. But um, don't abuse that autonomy. Don't, don't, 
class. And of course, have fun, right? This is a really great time for you. It's really, like I said, a lot of autonomy. Um, study hard, uh, but also don't forget to um, you know, uh, meet some people and have some fun as well. Um, after you go to college, so college, you usually go to high school for four years, you go to college for four years. If you want to then, you'll have an uh, opportunity to um, go on to graduate school. So, life after college then, you have a decision to make uh, to go to graduate school. You've got two basic <laughs> options in STEM. One is to get a master's degree, the other one is to get a, a, a doctor of a philosophy or a PhD. Um, the master's degree typically takes two or three years or so, and the PhD takes about five or six years. Um, so master's degree is more intense studies, more college classes, but it also has a research component as well. Research is basically something that hasn't been done before. In order to get a PhD, you have to make an original contribution to your field. So it means that you have to do some research, to have to study stuff that hasn't been done before, make a contribution, write some papers, and then basically write a, what's called a dissertation. It's basically uh, kind of a small little book that says, this is what I've done, this is what my, my contribution to the field of computer science or, or whatever, and then we'll give you a PhD after you've done that. Um, the master's degree, there's several different kinds of master's degrees. Some of them only have classroom components, so two or three more years of, of additional classes above and beyond will give you a master's degree. Um, some of them have a research component as well, where you actually do kind of like a little mini dissertation too. Um, why you get a master's degree is after your college education, you're hopefully going to be employable. Right? If you eat in the STEM field, you're almost certainly going to be employable. <laughs> But the job you can get with a bachelor's degree after college might not be at the same level as you could with a master's degree with a little more education. So if you really love you know, biology or chemistry or physics or whatever you want to, whatever your heart's desire, you can go for a few more years, maybe get a different school, get some more specified training, and then get a kind of a higher level job um, with a master's degree. A PhD is great for like, research scientists or professors, right? So, um, that's when you want to get uh, a PhD. Um, so graduate school, especially in STEM fields, often come, part of the, the experience of graduate school is becoming a teaching assistant, or TA, or a research assistant, or an RA. And these are paid positions. And oftentimes these come with tuition waivers as well. You're not going to get rich going to graduate school, but you're not going to get broke. You're not going to be broke either going to graduate school. Um, so that's part of the experience, that's part of the learning process of, of helping teach a class uh, or becoming a, a research assistant, working in the lab and getting more hands-on research with the professor. Um, you don't have to go into debt right, to attend graduate school in STEM. If STEM is different than, say, uh, getting a doctorate, though, like or a, you know, going to medical school or going to law school. There aren't the same opportunities for things like this um, as there are in you know, regular graduate school programs in the STEM. Um, I really love my graduate school experience. Uh, kind of working outside of the classroom, doing, contributing something that hasn't been done before. Um, I thought it was really, really good great. So, um, I, I, so that's all I really had. So uh, I want to acknowledge um, the Des Moines S5 group, uh, Gabe, for inviting me here. And uh, thank you for your attention.